Don't you wish we could go back to a time when art was simple? Back to the good old days when it was just an artist and some paints. Remember when everything wasn't so complicated? <laughs> yeah, me neither. This piece is called The Tower of Babel by Peter Bruegel the Elder. This hyper-detailed painting leaves little to the imagination, but maybe you're still wondering, what the crap is going on here? Yeah. Don't worry, we'll get to the bottom of it. The story goes something like this. Once upon a time in the far away land of Babylon, people decided to build a tower so tall it would reach to the heavens. They wanted to be more like God, but God didn't really like this at all and decided to turn their glorious tower into a crumbly lump. So God probably just poked it, right? Wrong. Instead, God confundiram sua linguagem para que ninguém pudesse se entender. What did you say? I think something about a chicken tender. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Let's try that again. Instead, God verwirrte ihre Sprache, so dass sich niemand mehr verstehen konnte. Okay, one last try. Instead, God muddled their language so no one could understand each other. And this is how languages began, and how this structure got the name the Tower of Babel. This story is clearly rooted in a Christian perspective, but is also based on Flavius Josephus' book, Antiquity of the Jews, that goes on to say that King Nimrod, the man to the left of the painting, was the visionary behind the construction of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. According to the Bible, Noah was a righteous man who lived during a time of wickedness and sin. So when God unleashed a great flood on the world as judgment on humanity, Noah was chosen to repopulate the earth. Josephus writes of King Nimrod, he persuaded them not to ascribe to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. I think it's fair to say that King Nimrod was still a little salty toward God, and his relentless pursuit of godhood seems to be paying off. Workers drop to the ground before him. Peter Bruegel the Elder captures this goofy look of denial on the faces of his entourage so perfectly, all while King Nimrod remains blissfully unaware, so engulfed in his own pride, that he fails to notice his dream disintegrating right in front of him. Oh yeah, the tower. First of all, it's absurdly massive. So much so that it dwarfs the town in the background, makes this castle look like a tiny speck, and pierces the clouds. But just as the Tower of Babel threatens to fulfill its promise of reaching the heavens, we get a sense that it never actually will because the base is crumbling, because of its jagged rocks and exposed scaffolding, because it's leaning, because everyone's frantically doing something but accomplishing very little. Either way, it's all hands on deck. Ships sail in to deliver materials. There's this ghost guy in a boat doing ghost things, I guess. We can even spot temporary houses that have been built into the side of the tower where people cook and hang linens up to dry. Workers the size of ants climb and hammer and hoist and operate human-sized hamster wheels and sleep and... Bruegel loved this little guy so much that he inserted him into many of his paintings, kind of like the 16th century version of Where's Waldo? This painting is dripping with dramatic irony. As an outsider, we know that this building will fail. In fact, we can see that it's actively collapsing. But everyone here is so caught up in the fog of the present to see the reality staring them right in the face. Not much is known about Peter Bruegel the Elder. We're not sure exactly where he was born or his family background. We're not even sure of his precise date of birth. But we do know that he was a humanist. We can see this 
and the painstaking detail he put into every person in this piece, no matter how small. This painting stands approximately four feet tall by five feet long, yet somehow every inch tells a separate story, like hundreds of little paintings in one. It gives me the feeling of Sonder, or the realization that everyone has a story and is living a life as complex and vivid as your own. Peter Bruegel the Elder made three separate versions of this subject. This one, also known as the Great Tower of Babel, the Little Tower of Babel, and the third version that has been since lost in time. Does this building look familiar to you? Maybe reminiscent of the Colosseum in Rome? This was likely an intentional choice on the artist's part. Rome was known as the Eternal City, a place Caesar intended to last forever. And at the time, Christians saw its decay as a symbol of the futility and impermanence of earthly endeavors. It was in this way that the artist was drawing a parallel between Rome and Babylon. But something else is off about this painting, because this place doesn't really look that much like Babylon. In fact, it resembles a European setting much more than a Middle Eastern one. There are a couple reasons I think this might be. The first possibility is that Peter Bruegel the Elder had no idea what the heck Babylon looked like. The second is he was trying to make a comparison between Babylon and Antwerp, the city he lived in when he created this piece. Let me explain. In 1563, Antwerp was a bustling port city that traded in luxury goods. It was known as the capital of capitalism, a place rich in cultural and religious diversity. It was also a hub for foreign trade, which caused both a population and a building boom. Around the time this painting was created, the Duke of Alba reported to King Philip II of Spain that Antwerp was a Babylon, confusion and receptacle of all sects indifferently, a state of affairs he strongly disapproved of, given Philip II, who ruled over Antwerp at the time, advocated a strict adherence to Catholicism. In fact, it's believed that the depiction of King Nimrod, dressed in Renaissance fashion, could be inspired by King Philip II. Both kings ruled with an iron fist, and I wonder if Bruegel viewed King Philip's efforts to enforce Spanish Catholic rule in Antwerp as unnatural as King Nimrod. Nimrod's determination to build a colossal tower. Both kings had big plans that were destined to fail. While Nimrod's tower was disrupted by the introduction of languages, Philip never learned to speak the languages of those in Antwerp in the first place, which only exacerbated religious tensions. If we look at the little tower of Babel, we can see that the structure, although imperfect, is much more complete than the other version. And there's one crucial difference. The king and his posse are nowhere to be found. Perhaps Peter Bruegel the Elder is trying to convey that success follows when the community's needs and wants are prioritized over the desires of the most powerful. So reach for the stars, but maybe don't build a colossal tower to reach them. Consider this painting exposed. Thank you to my amazing channel members. I'll see you in the next one.